Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, it's really wonderful to see all of you here tonight. My name is Jess Karen Dillon. I'm an associate professor of global studies and anthropology at the New School in New York City. And um, it's really wonderful the... to see all of you here tonight. My name is... <laughs> Apparently, I'm on stereo also. <laughs> um, and I'm a member of the Worker Cooperative here. Welcome to Making Worlds Bookstore and Social Center. So a couple of logistical reminders before we get started for tonight. Please keep your mask on for the duration of the event unless you're speaking um, up here at the front. The bathroom is right behind in case you need it. Um, if you want to browse our book collection, you'll have an opportunity to do so at the end of the event and hopefully make some purchases too. Um, and we um, have some of Stephen's books here as well for sale. Um, and we're live streaming this event. We had a request from uh, so some folks in Palestine to do so. So we're going to honor that request. And so the event is being live streamed. So for those of you who are new to Making Worlds and for those of you watching over the live stream, welcome from the other side of the globe. Making Worlds is a nonprofit cooperative bookstore and social center that promotes collective knowledge, skills and visions of liberation from our communities. By distributing literature and other resources, as well as fostering a vibrant cultural programming space, we aim to strengthen grassroots organizing for people to care and support for each other and make worlds of liberation possible. Through diverse political and cultural education initiatives, we promote learning from each other and the intersecting histories and futures of community organizing and movement building of indigenous black and brown people and others resisting oppression worldwide. One of the most important aspects of the work we are attempting to undertake in this space is to promote and foster a deep commitment to internationalism that is anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, and informed by an anti-racist and indigenous feminism that reflects a deep commitment to global solidarity. We are living in a moment of immense environmental devastation and climate catastrophe, ongoing war and militarization here in the United States and across the globe rampant violence from racial capitalism in all of its manifestations and shifting forms of fascism among many other social, political and economic problems. We desperately need to find ways to understand how our lives are interwoven with the lives of others, both near and far, and how to create an architecture of decolonization that is capable of rising to the gravity of this moment. I know in my own research, writing and organizing, I've been thinking a great deal about these things. It couldn't be more apparent that we need revolutionary changes in our social, political and economic systems and that we need them now. But how we go about the business of organizing ourselves for radical political change matters. We have some crucial work to do to figure out how to build stronger movements and reconfigure solidarity in ways that fosters durable and adaptable bonds between us that remain intact in the wake of, consistent, of the consistent impact of social, political, and economic structures around us that are explicitly designed to unravel those bonds. Given all of this, it is really fitting that our inaugural event series this, falls, this fall opens with a conversation with Stephen Salida. I can't tell you how excited I am for this conversation to unfold this evening. I know many of us in this room have um, learned a tremendous amount from Stephen's work his contributions, of course, are critical and fundamental to helping us shape a more politically astute understanding of Palestine and also of the stakes of what it means to engage in, a building, in building a revolutionary movement that supports its freedom and liberation. As Stephen reminds us in internationalism, decolonizing Native America and Palestine. Oh, one sec here. Solidarity requires ethical commitments to function. A functional solidarity does not involve appropriation. It does not come with the expectation of reciprocity. It is not quid pro quo. It is not recorded on ledgers. Solidarity is performed in the interest of better human relationships and for a world that allows societies to be organized around justice rather than profit. It happens across the communities with whom we are in contact on behalf of the many we have never met." End quote. Stephen has also taught us a great deal about how many of our institutions, including our institutions of higher education, 
function to reproduce colonial formations, enact epistemic violence, and foster ways of being in the world that promote individualism over collective power. I'm an avid and enthusiastic reader of Stephen's blog, No Flags, No Slogans, always inspired by his unflinchingly truthful, powerful, urgent, and beautiful writing. His political contributions have great pedagogical import. In fact, I've taught from his most recent book, Internationalism, um, this semester, um, and one of my students is actually here from New York, came down <laughs> to meet Stephen after reading his book this semester. Um, Stephen is also the author of Uncivil Rights, Palestine and Limits of Academic Freedom, which we also have for sale here. Um, we Could Be Free, Palestine and the Revolutionary Imagination, and five other books, all of which I encourage you to buy. Needless to say, all of us here at Making Worlds are absolutely thrilled to have you with us tonight, Stephen, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Give me just a second to set myself up here. Well, good evening. Um, thank you very much for for coming out. Um, it's it's a tremendous honor and and pleasure to to share this space with you um, this evening. And and greetings to everybody who's catching the um, the the live stream. Um, I, I appreciate you tuning in. Um, I'm 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 going to ask for your patience and possibly forgiveness at the outset. I haven't done um, any public speaking in a while, a practice that has always been a source of, of mixed feelings for me. Um, I normally speak off the cuff about the topic at hand or about a million offhand topics, but for this event, I decided to compose my thoughts. I want to be precise to the degree that I'm capable, and it seems unkind anyway to subject you to a bunch of tangents that may or may not amount to something coherent. I'm more interested in the ensuing discussion, and, and so I'll try to give us something useful to think about. When the folks at Making Worlds approached me about doing an event they proposed something around indigenous solidarity, and it was difficult to pass on that kind of opportunity. It's a rich, complex topic with an endless assortment of possibilities, something we all ought to embrace because possibility is the only tangible resource in the marketplace of ideas these days. Indigenous solidarity is also subject to a lot of misinformation and hostility. So we can approach the topic by demarcating material politics from orthodoxy and myth. U.S. exceptionalism, that enduring psychosis indivisible from conquest and plunder, is the greatest progenitor of orthodoxy and myth. It is ubiquitous in the American psyche. Even leftist discourses are often tethered to U.S. exceptionalism. Well, what does it look like for a leftist discourse to be tethered to U.S. exceptionalism? It looks like a magnetic attraction to elections and good citizenship and civic responsibilities, as if systemic illness can be cured by a more mindful diagnosis. It looks like that inevitable regression of thought leaders into libertarian fantasies of individual salvation as a knee-jerk response to crisis. It looks like invasive anxiety about sedition and disorder. It looks like anything really that can only imagine revolution as something unimaginable. More than anything, the beating heart of US exceptionalism rarely slows down enough to alter deeply ingrained habits of perception. When we discuss colonization or imperialism or racism, where do we end up, no matter where we started? Contemplating the destiny of the party who enjoys greater structural power, right? Think about it for a second. Replay some noteworthy conversations you had recently. Which party acted as the gravitational force of group rhetoric? The black speaker 
or the aggrieved white audience, the Palestinian or the ambiguous liberal Zionist, the native or the settler. You might not have even noticed at the time, but it happened, didn't it? Doesn't it always? It's too easy to fall back into concern for demographics that unquestionably occupy the category of human. But what about the white landowner? But what about the Israeli refusenik? But what about the politician's career? But what about Joe Sixpack's sensibilities? Only after sorting these essential matters do we get to the downtrodden if our interest hasn't already been exhausted. Conversely, if you're the type who insists on the primacy of the downtrodden, think about how many times you've tried to refocus interlocutors who always drift back to what black liberation will do to American democracy, back to what Palestine means to Jewish Americans, back to what becomes of Sally and Johnny and their suburban utopia in a land back scenario. It rarely works, does it? You keep insisting and they either ignore you or grow defensive. You become a purist, a wrecker, a fantasist, a connoisseur of the circular firing squad. Why is the first impulse always to worry about reproduction of common sense, to worry about the colonial entity, to worry about the settler? Precisely because it's not an impulse. It's a lifetime of coercion pretending to be organic. Treating chauvinism as impulsive is one way that settler common sense so easily sells itself as objective and universal. This is US exceptionalism in action, and those who work hard to avoid it are reviled for their irrational attachment to unreality. It's a ritual ostracism, compulsive and relentless, intended to warn potential dissidents against any attempt to reverse a colonial state of exception. Take a look at the leftist pundit class, the academic luminaries, the social media influencers. They spent six years glorifying Bernie Sanders. A lot of them boosted Tulsi Gabbard. They're obsessed with the squad. They hold forth about Syria, about China, about Iran, about Venezuela, and yet in the end, they're all the same kind of liberal. When it matters, they all cape for whichever democratic savior is in fashion. Ultimately, the differences around which they stage so much conflict are superficial or at best cosmetic and have more to do with capturing market share in a competitive subscriber economy than with any kind of revolutionary sentiment. Exceptionalism doesn't prevent people from seeing... That's a good book. Okay. Uh, <laughs> exceptionalism doesn't prevent people from seeing a world on the edge of being destroyed. It prevents them from imagining a solution beyond the system implicated in the world's destruction. I begin with this rant with apologies, to arrive at an unpleasant but straightforward conclusion. Everything we know about virtually anything is evanescent and unstable. And so everything needs to change. It's going to change anyway, whether we like it or not. Sally and Johnny won't be able to enjoy their idyllic suburban life forever or even very far into the future. We are in the early stages of a cataclysm. The changes are coming, those that aren't here already. That's the one thing we have to recognize. There's no halcyon restoration on the horizon, no magic technological solution, no back to normal. Easy fixes are beyond reach. Our task is to aim for the least amount of suffering and to initiate a new epoch that doesn't prioritize extraction and profit over the well-being of life on this planet. I just grabbed that water, by the way. I don't even know who, who it belonged to, but uh, it's, it's, uh, thank you very much. Well, during the first week of September, I, I went on a bike ride with my wife and son, and I think my son might be watching the live stream now. You know, um, 
be good tonight. Um, and, and my brother-in-law and his family. I live in Northern Virginia, which is car heavy, but the area has terrific bike and recreation trails that were underused until the pandemic. We decided to ride along a creek that flows out of a nearby reservoir, which much to my amusement, they like to call a lake. I'd been on the path a number of times. Um, when my son learned to ride a bike, we used to cycle down the trail and stop periodically to wade in the creek. Mid-Atlantic summer gets hot and humid, but the journey was never especially unpleasant. Well, on the family outing, something immediately fell off when we entered the woods alongside the reservoir. It was unusually muggy, especially for the end of meteorological summer. I was sweating like a busted fire hydrant. It was one of those itchy sweats, too, as if fire ants were slip sliding down my back. My lungs were wet and heavy. The foliage sagged with dampness and tree trunks showed a deeper shade of brown. I felt like I was in the goddamn Everglades. Mosquitoes were everywhere, biting us through our shirts. I kept expecting to see alligators in the standing pools of water lining both sides of the path. And those standing pools were also unusual. Sure, they might appear after a round of thunderstorms, but not so extensively and never so consistently. It had been raining a lot. Same as the past few years, monthly rainfall totals for DC, the DC area were up with several records getting broken. I'm the type who finds rain depressing, so it's something I noticed. Beyond my aversion to rain, I was concerned at a more galactic level. It, it didn't feel right. The world as I understood it, based on climate patterns and ecological character was no longer the same. It didn't feel right. I don't know what else to say. Was I just getting old and crotchety? Or was something objectively different about the feel of things, about the entire atmosphere? It's hard to talk about because most people perceive it as complaining about the weather. I've spent plenty of time in my life complaining about the weather, and even in this familiar grievance, everything feels different. In any case, it's not complaining about the weather. It's about perceiving changes in the weather that portend a near future of very bad things. Perhaps that near future is actually the present. Lord knows a lot of very bad things are already in evidence. The usual assumptions about good governance no longer hold up to reality, but reality can be a difficult site of analysis. Capitalism pretends that its solutions to the very problems it created are uniquely humane and ethical. We're no longer in any position to dicker around with such nonsense. The only thing capitalism will provide is the ability to feel smug and self-satisfied in the moment of our demise. It has neither the intention nor the ability to stop that demise, however. I share this experience of biking in an abruptly tropical mid-Atlantic because it's important to acknowledge and claim our feelings of disorientation. Those feelings aren't an alien concept to students of indigenous studies anyway. Our unquiet earth has been a major theme in native literature for many decades. Leslie Marmon Silko's Almanac of the Dead, Linda Hogan's Power, James Welch's Winter in the Blood, and so forth. Indigenous activists throughout the Americas have been sounding the alarm about an, about an impending ecocide and have been at the forefront of efforts to disrupt normal patterns of extraction and consumption, the hallmarks of imperialism. This activism, dangerous and unpretentious, is intended to benefit all of Earth's living creatures. It is a resistance focused on survival, justice, empathy. The people devoted to national liberation aren't talking about winning any fucking elections. That's where our attention belongs, on the people doing the indispensable work of survival. It requires effort to focus our attention where it belongs, though, because those with enough power to decide what kind of activism matters from astroturfing NGOs to sock dim media, sure as hell aren't gonna put any spotlight on sites of meaningful insurgency. So it's up to us as individuals and social beings to find inspiration among the creatures unloved by power. 
we can provide and receive the simplest kind of love among one another, the kind that honors our need for safety and freedom. That love exists in the refugee camps of Gaza, in the resource-rich villages of the Amazon jungle, in the water-poisoned households of Flint and Standing Rock. We have to put aside the pursuits that generate rewards in the Imperium and make ourselves students of their example. The only hope I felt over the past few years didn't come from AOC's ascension to a colonial governing body or from Palestinian representation in Congress and the NYPD, but from black protesters burning down a police station and the Palestinian resistance in Gaza, which fought the Zionist entity to a standstill. The old Fanonian idea that we recover dignity through struggle rings truer than ever, for resistance is the only thing that gives me life these days. All the gabbing I see in the public environs of the North American left is at best depressing. I dare say I'm far from alone. Ours is an era of illness and ecocide. And ours is a society that confuses rebooted culture wars with intellectual culture. We haven't begun processing the widespread trauma from COVID, which of course is ongoing. The disease not only transformed social and economic relations, it also altered most of the familiar ideological categories we could at least superficially rely on before. This on top of massive death and anxiety and the dissolution of untold personal relationships. The pandemic has accelerated a long-standing sense of uncertainty, but that certainty, but that uncertainty is ironic and unacknowledged. These days, more people seem absolutely certain about the right solution without any real understanding of the problems they aim to solve. I wish I could offer suggestions that might rise above cliche or truism, but the language we use to inspire activism can be a cipher for the very uncertainty we purport to counteract. Organize, resist, make a revolution. Well, all this stuff is well and good, but in what capacity do we organize? And to what end do we revolt? These are terms that sound nice, in the rah-rah confines of social media, which reward insipidness and sloganeering, but say nothing to the indigent classes who would gladly let rich neighborhoods burn if the pundits they've never heard of were serious. People who profit from the status quo will run interference for power at the moment of truth, no matter how grandiloquent their language. We have to recognize who's even viable as a revolutionary before we get too optimistic about the revolution. Professors and podcasters and politicians are limited by their very status. Maybe instead of nebulous pronouncements about decolonization and resistance, we should speak more precisely. You know, be explicit about burning down police stations or launching rockets or sabotaging pipeline equipment but the great majority of us can't do that. Talking that kind of noise will get respectable members of society into a lot of trouble. Only those already loathed by respectable society have the luxury of naming their desires and tactics. In the end, we have to keep asking, who has incentive to be serious about an uprising? We might do well to also ask, which aspect of this person's commitment suggests any willingness at all to do right by the downtrodden, to do anything other than conform when it actually matters. We have to make judgments about reliability and trustworthiness. We have to opt out of spaces enthralled to the narcissism of Western common sense. We have to know when we're boosting the low key guardians of our dispossession. My dim view of the institutional North American left arises from a lifetime of observation. And I've grown exhausted and I wasn't gonna pass the opportunity to observe and complain. 
Thousands of times I've seen the same messianic compulsion to exhort the lesser peoples of the globe, indigenous nations in particular, from Palestine to the Salish coast. This is what they need to do. This is what they ought to avoid. That kind of resistance is unhelpful. They're being unrealistic. They can't be so inflexible. Their government isn't up to my standard. They need to do X, Y, and Z to earn my support. They have to meet people where they're at. That last one has always been a special source of annoyance. Exhorting an oppressed group to meet people where they're at consigns that oppressed group to the category of non-people. The proverbial people of this formulation represent humanity itself. And so the oppressed group must aspire to become half human by conceding to the very logic of their inhumanity. Without such concessions, they will remain in an indefinite state of barbarity. These paladins of common sense kowtow to one politician after another, Bernie, Tulsi, Ilhan, AOC, all the while demeaning anyone who expresses skepticism, an age-old liberal disciplining tactic, and then take up the mantle of a principled dissenter when the once impeccable politician is sucked dry of social capital. There's an ironclad law of social climbing in the United States. You can be the biggest revolutionary in the world in between elections, but when it comes time to seat bodies in the Imperium, you'd better cape for one of the Democratic candidates. Otherwise, you become disposable along with the Earth's wretched denizens for whom you advocate. <laughs> I don't view this phenomenon as a habit to be broken. It's a colonial sensibility to be expunged. We don't have time to be disgruntled after the inevitable betrayal, not even a betrayal really, more like an arc barreling toward its typical ending. Nobody will give a damn who was right or wrong during the cataclysm anyway. Again, what I describe as a fundamental aspect of US exceptionalism with its fidelity to individual status in the information economy. However, we choose to speak of internationalism or solidarity or revolution or decolonization. The terms are worse than useless without a concomitant understanding of the phenomena they purport to describe. And so I've come to understand that North American sensibilities are anathema to internationalism. It's not that influencers and thought leaders in this sphere have no interest in internationalism. They just lack the intellectual framework and often the desire to abandon the comforts of liberal normativity. They're enamored of marketable rhetoric and end up depleting radical terminology of meaning. Our conversations shouldn't end with us mourning the decline of a once promising system in need of redemption. Capitalism is functioning as designed. Colonization was never about improving the world. It is now the decolonial that needs to be redeemed. What is internationalism then? Oh, we can reference lots of good definitions. At its most fundamental, internationalism is an old Marxist concept that posits an affinity among ruling classes. Their affinity requires a corresponding solidarity among the oppressed. For instance, workers qua workers share affinities that transcend borders and ethnicity. They ought to unite for both strategic and moral reasons. Capital is voracious and constantly seeks new markets. It needs to encounter resistance at every turn. The term has evolved over the years to reference intercultural communalism and tactical alliances. While internationalism retains a universal connotation, it has become more specific. Ferguson and Gaza, for instance, or Standing Rock and Kashmir. If the imperialist states like to bang on about shared values, the thinking goes, then so should the dispossessed. We are stronger in one another's company capable of mutual validation, 
free to share and learn. There's also an ethical component to these current iterations, simple but powerful. Palestine can't properly be free while Hawaii is still occupied. Such pronouncements oblige us to consider liberation as a shared project. It snaps us out of provincialism. Most important, it demands focus on capitalism, the unifying feature of oppression, a task that becomes increasingly critical as the Twitch and Twitter professoriate process radical concepts into neoliberal buzzwords. One interesting convergence between <clears throat> pardon me, theoretical work and popular discourse is the notion of land back, much debated in online leftist communities. On the one hand, the emergence of land back in today's activist lexicon is, is something of a victory for indigenous communities who have long presented the case for national liberation to often uninterested or hostile audiences in the West. On the other hand, it also reveals a continued stubbornness within the North American left to fully or even rudimentarily comprehend the primacy of settler colonization in the set of evils they otherwise abhor. We don't need to separate settler colonization from imperialism or militarism. The three phenomena aren't identical, but they're certainly interconnected. And refusal to acknowledge and examine colonization limits depth of engagement with imperialism and militarism. In fact, it puts a hard cap on one's ability to make sense of capitalism. It also reveals structural absences in the way many commenters approach questions of internationalism. Where are indigenous peoples in our Rolodex of concerns, indigenous histories, indigenous theories, any notion of solidarity that diverges from indigeneity is bound to assume a managerial perspective. How many times have pragmatists or self-branded anti-imperialists suggested that Palestinians and natives and black people need to defer their aspirations in order to facilitate electoral success for members of the Democratic Party? How many times have we been dogpiled and insulted for suggesting that it's unethical to dispose of the least powerful among us simply to gratify a feeble political desire. No, we're not deferring to shit. And we're not disposing of anyone presented to us as disposable. Certainly not to grease some two-bit pundit's naked quest for influence. Misunderstanding of land back derives in part from this attachment to political convention. Even when the concept is understood, it's sometimes only at a superficial level. Land back isn't an online phenomenon, some new phrase emerging from an intractable era of wokeness. It is internet shorthand for a broad and rigorous set of indigenous intellectual traditions. It distills and at time bastardizes centuries-long liberation movements with land as their guiding principle. Land back is a simple, straightforward term, vague enough for widespread misapprehension. I'm not going to waste time reassuring anyone that it doesn't mean dragging white people out of their living rooms and putting them on the next ship to Genoa. We've covered the problems with that approach already. The important thing to remember is that manifold struggles precede and contextualize the slogan. Read Robert Warrior, read Lee Miracle, read Leanne Howe, read Audra Simpson, read Glenn Coulthard, read Eileen Moreton Robinson, read Patrick Wolf, read the breathtaking work of the Hawaiian liberation movement, Noe Noe Silva, Haunani K. Trask, Noelani Goodyear, Kaupua. It goes on and on. A huge body of work gives meaning to the term land back. And my notion of work includes centuries of practice. None of this stuff is secret, nor is it esoteric. It's perfectly comprehensible. It tells us exactly what is needed to undo grave injustices. This work isn't breezily ignored because it lacks value, but because it requires people to rethink so many sacred commonplaces. It demands that we no longer operate in states of exception. 
And finally, what of solidarity? Solidarity is a good word, but like any word that is overused, it has become loose and evasive. You cannot have solidarity without recognition. That is to say, without an incursion into other people's concerns and sensibilities. Solidarity isn't simply about joining hands. It means changing your own attitude to fit with a broader vision of liberation. You try to give of yourself, and what you get in return is a more rigorous education. You learn the essential skill of outfitting the universal with the specific. You can make a good argument that overcoming ignorance is the first step to a meaningful solidarity. From there, we can imagine the framework for a livable future. Livability is contingent on a willingness to suffer and persist. Left techno-modernists, anti-indigenous on their face, will tell you that science can provide easy solutions to climate collapse and scarcity, that some exotic version of socialism will enable us to exist in luxury. But in reality, they're selling a glossy brand of colonization. The future requires less consumption, individually and collectively. It requires serious changes of lifestyle, not just of lifestyle, but of life ways that require vigorous atonement and introspection. We cannot continue viewing the earth as a source of abundance. It has been made to overprovide for a tiny fraction of our species. The bill for ruling class greed has come due in the world's ghettos and refugee camps. Revolution is the only viable way to clear the ledger. We need a future that values generosity and sacrifice. We need a future that prioritizes inheritance of the... We even want a future. We need a future that is indigenous. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Stephen. That was really, I mean, you gave us so much to think about. I know for myself, I'll probably be listening to this a couple of times to catch everything that you shared with us this evening. And I think there's, you know, there's so many points of um, entry to the things that you shared with us and talked about tonight. Um, and I, yeah, a million questions as I'm sure everyone else does too. But one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I know when you first arrived, we were chatting about this briefly, um, that it's incredibly difficult to stay hopeful in this moment. Yes. And one of the things that you talked about at the very beginning of your talk tonight was um, the idea of possibility, which is something that I al also always think about how, you know, possibility is the entryway to at least believing or um, imagining that um, a different kind of world can come into being, my, probably through, you know, obviously many, many things, many of which you listed at the end of your, closer to the end of your talk. So I'm wondering if you can offer us any insight into how you stay hopeful about the possibility of a possibility. <laughs> sure. this off and, and, um, answer the, the, the question or try to answer the question first by again um thanking you all for hosting me and then thanking you all for for coming and and partaking of this discussion and to to reiterate that if, if you know if you have a bone to pick or, or a quibble to make or or something stronger you know <laughs> then um I'm, I'm i'll do my best to, to listen and, and respond i um 
it's just something I've been thinking about. I think since before the pandemic, um, but but it, 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 it's also something that that keeps appearing in a lot of the reading I do in uh, you know online on social media in, in in the books that that I still manage to pick up and read is this, this increased sense of and I don't even know the right word malaise is semi-accurate but doesn't quite cover it hopelessness is semi-accurate but doesn't quite cover it but just this 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 sense that something is off that something is deeply off and I you know from my last uh, teaching uh, gig at the American University of Beirut I'm, I'm still in touch with with some of my former students from there and you know they, they keep me um, apprised of, of the goings-on in, in their young careers or in some cases their young non-careers right and you know how frustrating it is they, they want to go here they want to go there they don't have the money you know there's uh there's no possibility of a job the the job ads are increasingly you know requiring much more than they used to and 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 I, I got to think I don't, I don't know if you all will will feel this the same way or, or anybody um i'm, I'm 46 uh, my age or, or older would 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 feel the same way but i i almost you know i i sometimes reflect that i, I feel like i was part of the last generation of college students who went through that process with at least some sense that there was a, still a future for us right of course we we worried about jobs and of course a lot of people never could get jobs and, and didn't have money or other means to get into college in the first place but i'm talking about a specific demographic right that we my my cohort of college students you know I don't know, some of us have more advantages than others, but there wasn't this sense of, of dread that there's going to be nothing for us at the end of it. And even if there is, <laughs> then it's all going to be underwater. And I, I've heard people so often talking about how this is um, alarmism and, and fear mongering. And I, I kind of used to think that way, but the, you know, the more I read, they, not just scientific literature, but uh, you know, eco-socialist texts um, by, by very, very smart writers. Um, you know, you look at the numbers and then you just feel the feelings that you feel, right? When you're out and about in the world, you, you know that it's not bullshit, right? The, the specifics might be off, but th there, there's a sense that what's bad now is only going to get worse. And, and that's a terrible place to be in both as an individual in a society and as a society itself, however you want to identify it, whoever you're going to consider your cohort. This is a very roundabout way of, of saying that um, it's a struggle to maintain a, a, a sense of, of hope or, or possibility in these conditions. I think COVID has, has made things worse in that regard. It's, it's brought certain things to the, the, the surface. It's, it's exposed for better or worse um, to people who might not have apprehended it on their own, you know, some of the inherent problems of, of capitalism. But what's it going to look like in 20 years, right? And it's one of the, the hallmarks of depression to not be able to imagine a meaningful future, right? So people get depressed when they think, well, what the hell is, is there for me? You know, I'm old, I'm going to be dead in six years. You know, I'm going to just sit around, you know, s smoke cigarettes, uh, you know, uh, mistreat my body, abuse my body, because it doesn't matter, right? And so I, I, I see something as, as kind of a, uh, maybe the, the right word is, is not malaise or hopelessness, but a depression, you know, a, a sense of, of possibility that, that, that's been taken. And so in order to... to to maintain hope, I, I, it's something more than just, oh, okay, I have a kid, okay, and, and, I, and I want the world to be better for him and for all the other children. It's something more than that. It's that, that we, I, I'm not going to say we, all right, really, I don't, I don't like to implicate the entire species. I really don't. It's like when people talk about the government, well, we did this, we, I didn't do shit, you know, the, <laughs> the government did that, you know what I mean? The police did that. Don't, don't, you know, no, you know, I'm willing to, to accept my responsibility where, where, uh, you know we're we're necessary we're realistic but uh you know don't 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 lump all, all of us into the same crowd but um <laughs> as a species under capitalism right 
the ruling classes have spent centuries fucking things up. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, just taking from the earth and taking from the earth without any, it's, it's the worst kind of sociopathy that I don't give a shit what happens to everybody else, to future generations, as long as I turn a profit this quarter. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't even imagine that that kind of mentality, but that is in fact the mentality that, that drives economic growth and development, et cetera, et cetera, and personal wealth. And so I, I think about, I think about sticking it to them, honestly. <laughs> That gives me a sense of hope and, and <laughs> possibility. Honestly, I, I, I want to see Elon Musk, Wilku, whoever we want, sorry ass, in handcuffs, right? I want Jeff Bezos' sorry ass sitting in a jail cell. Yeah, I'm an abolitionist, but you know, we make, <laughs> we make exceptions, right? Uh, we make exceptions. Um, I, some of you are probably mad at me for that, but uh, I'm half joking, half serious. But um, I, I, I envision a future in which, you know, I, I love the old cliche biblical passage where the meek inherit the earth. And I, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but that, that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about, right? The, in, in so many ways, I've been sort of... Uh, cast out and, and, and exiled, not, not just from, you know, academia, but from a lot of activist spaces, because I take a very sort of firm line mm -hmm. on Palestine, that if there's any Zionist shit in this narrative, I don't know, I have nothing to do with it. I don't care if it's a policy, I don't care who it is. Do you know what I mean? I don't care how famous this person, no Zionism, period, the end, right? Uh, so bye-bye your favorite democratic politician, because they all Zionists to one degree or another. And, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not going to cape for one. So I, I, I'm sort of sitting in, in, in this space where I feel very lonely, right? uh, very, uh, very frustrated, but also in this space where I also feel motivated. It's like, fine, there's a whole world of people who feel lonely and downtrodden in exactly the same way I do. And I, I quite like to spend my time seeking them out and, and, and thinking about what it would look like to live in a world that has space for us and that cares about us and allows us to care about other people, right? In, in, in the way that we want to, right? Without being accused of, of wrecking and purism and et cetera, et cetera, that allows us to prioritize those among us who are in most need of love and solidarity. So that's an extremely long answer, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, everybody's like, that's I'm not gonna ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fantastic answer. Um, so this leads me actually perfectly to my next question, which is, how do you find those people? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. Um, I, you know, they're in this room. They're, um... And what kinds of spaces do you, you know, platform? You know, we're, we're sitting in this bookstore. Those of us that have been involved in this project yeah. um, since its inception, um, you know, Nikki, Shanev, Malov, myself and many others, like we thought a lot about what it means to create a space, uh -huh. right? So, uh -huh. because part of what we want to do is find those people. Uh -huh. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'd start with um, the, 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 the company we're in right now. Certainly um, a lot of you probably haven't agreed with everything I've said, or, or some of you might have disagreed with everything I've said, but there are people in here who have reacted to my voice in such a way that, that that creates a deep sense of affinity. And that happens all the time online and off. I've, I've become, you know, I don't believe in, in you know, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a biological definition of instinct, in, instinct, but sociologically, I don't believe in like instinct or impulse. I, I believe that we're conditioned in, in, in certain ways and that, you know, sometimes our, our, what we imagine to be visceral reactions are actually conditioned reactions. But despite that, I've, I've I, I, I like to be guided by the, the sense that, that there's an affinity here. And when I, when I feel that sense of affinity, you know, I, I, I like to listen to it. And it happens, you know, back, back in the past when I was able to travel. But, you know, it, it happens very often online, to be frank. And so much of our lives are, are online now. But, um, you know, my, my DMs are, are filled with people that I've become um, really close with, as funny as that sounds. Um, I look for, for that kind of person in, in my day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, 
we, optimally, we would find it with family, but I know that for for many of us, you know, uh, family doesn't quite serve that that role. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes it serves the, the the opposite role. But I think that it, it it's largely a matter of of of, of responding to a, a particular emotional and intellectual need when you're in the presence of other people, and when when that sense of affinity exists. You know, if you're in a position to, to, you know, to be in communication with this person, sort of reach out and and um, sort of uh, explore where you're at, share ideas with one another, um, support. I I I can't do much, uh, but you know, a lot of people, a lot of people get in trouble for for speaking up on on Palestine, and it's getting worse and worse. And so, I, I mean, you know, I'm. I'm one of the more noteworthy in, in terms of notoriety, right? Not not in terms of experience, in terms of notoriety, one of the most noteworthy people. So uh, they, they, they DM me and say, I'm feeling terrible. I don't know what to do. I feel like my life is over or, you know, X, Y, Z, I'm angry. And, you know, sometimes I say, look, you know, what happened to you is awful. You're not alone. I love you and support you. Okay. I can't say that you're going to get your job back or that you're going to get an equal job or a better job, but I can say that you're not going to do this alone. And I, I think that's the kind of, of affinity I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in developing with people that we're not going to go into this very scary and, and very likely difficult future alone. When we get the chance to travel uh, by whatever means we travel, I think there are all kinds of, of interesting people to meet, especially when you go off the proverbial beaten path. You know, um, my best friend is 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 from the Barej camp in, in Gaza. I met him in Palestine in the year 2000. We've been best friends ever since. Um, and so some, sometimes when you open yourself up to communities and to places and to individuals that you've been conditioned to ignore, Right? You end up with a lot of wonderful surprises. Not that I was conditioned to ignore anybody from Gaza, but you know, I guess you you get my point. You know, I know that's kind of vague, but you know, that we we're trying to get through, and you know, it's 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 nice to know that 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 um, we don't have to do it alone. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I think I will open it up to for some Q and A. From I'll stand over there just so I can see everyone. Everyone, um, and do you want to do anything with the mic before I move? No, it's all good. Okay, so I'll do my best to not not go. <laughs> all right. So questions. Go ahead, please. I'll I'll say some words and ask for your response. I'll say the word nimbus and Pegasus, and NSO, and danger that, that people are actually in. Thank you. And my response to those words? Um, the only one I, I recognize, I think, is, is danger. Um, I, 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 don't, I, don't know what, uh, I don't know what Nimbus and, and Pegasus is. Am, is there a, am I missing something? Uh, please, please. Um, Nimbus is a a project of Google and Amazon. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Pegasus is the spy system for Israel. Ah, uh, okay, okay. No, no, no I, I recognize it. No, thank you, thank you. Um, this is a little bit, um, and I, 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 I hate to, to be, uh, you know, uh, pitiful and and disappointing in in any of my answers, but that's 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 this is kind of a an, an inevitability. <laughs> With me because I, the range of things I know is small, and the range of things that I'm willing to discuss uh, on camera is even smaller. Not not out of fear, but, but because I, I don't. I, I like to feel like I have a solid footing, and I just don't know much about how you know these 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 tech companies are 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 interfering in in our lives, interfering with our very um, biology. So I, I it, it's. I know in a broad way you're asking about uh, the way that, that, that technology and, and social media companies in, in, in particular are harming us or, you know, uh, the ways that, that, that we're being um, observed and cataloged and, and, and 
you know, marked for punishment as as necessary. But I really don't know the um, I really don't know the the specifics of of how these things occur. So I, I just, as a general rule, um, imagine that any technological site that has heavy usage is ultimately a place of danger or of potential danger to go back to the word that you used. So I, you know, I use these platforms. I use not as much as I used to, but I use these social media and it's always with an awareness that I'm being cataloged for advertisers that I'm becoming a, that I've made myself into a commodity that I've, uh, to a degree given myself over to uh, various intelligence services we all do when when we uh, you know when we log on to 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 facebook or whatever but um it's such a overwhelming source of power in today's world that the only thing i can the only response i have is to say that uh, they whatever conception of revolution that we can put forward it would absolutely have to include the dissolution of those entities and um, the um, you know the prosecution whatever that would look like under a better society of those who created and profit from them right and uh, tied into that of course is the dissolution of exploitative corporate entities which is to say corporate entities mm -hmm. and intelligence services as well Um, are, you, are you familiar with uh, Richard Wolf, the Marxian economist? Vaguely, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, with all with the talking about revolution, I'm curious, <laughs> do you think that this sort of concept of trying to change the economy gradually to a more cooperative economy, uh, do you feel that that is an effective means, or do you think it's too gradualist, or do you think it's just one of the many facets that must, one of the many, uh, methodologies we must use to get towards where we want to go sure i am um that's a good, a good question um th thank you i i i think that I, i've largely run out of patience or i'm overwhelmed by um a, a sense of urgency in in the moment that i've i've moved away from the gradualist approaches and and you know people can respond reasonably by saying well we can do both we can work on on gradualist approaches to creating a more cooperative society while we also do work on on revolutionary possibilities but i think that that's true more in the abstract than in practice that i i find that it's the um it's the the, the reformism and then the gradualism that ends up taking up the majority of people's time and that ends up uh, uh, proffering rewards in people's careers and people's uh, online presence that, 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 that ends up um, taking uh, a priority if, 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 you know, if only unwittingly. So I don't think that there's anything objectionable about trying to create fairer and, and juster spaces, especially in our local environments. In fact, that, that you know, th th this, that's a commendable action. I would say that making worlds is, is an example of that, right? Of, of creating a space where, you know, interesting conversations can happen, where, uh, you know, a, a, a body of, of, of interesting uh, revolutionary literature, et cetera. But we need to think about gradualism and reformism in relation to the kind of timeline that we perceive. And I think that's where the rub is. You know, there's just, again, um, I'm, I'm guided by a sense of, of urgency and immediacy right now. And I think gradualism as a local politic is important, right? Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, creating cooperative spaces to make the world more livable in the present is, is deeply important. And kudos to the folks who do that kind of work. Um, but at a broader 
level, let's say uh, at the level of national or, or international politics, you know, this this is not a, a supposition, right? It's not, um, you know, it's 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 not, it's not a hypothesis that, you know, we've been told over and over and over again to vote for the lesser evil, you know, to to vote to do this to do that, right? And shit's gonna get better, and shit keeps getting worse. You know, so I, I, I'm saying, you know, there's actually a body of, of, of evidence that tells us that reformism or gradualism in the electoral arena, right, isn't going to get us anywhere close to where we want. It doesn't mean you don't vote at all. Look, go vote if you want to, right? Don't shame other people for not voting. Maybe they have a damn good reason for not doing it. And shaming people for not voting is a shit thing to do. I'm telling you from experience. All right. But um, just, just don't do it. But do, do what you want in that regard. But to affix right, a, a sense of real possibility to that arena is 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 nothing more than a mythology, right? They, they, you know, the the right wingers that were meant to to stave off keep getting worse. The left, you know, the liberals that were supposed to compromise for keep getting worse as well, right? Everything keeps keeps moving in a worse direction. So yeah, I make a distinct. I think in terms of what we perceive to be the timeline of the world and then think in terms of, of, of what might be useful as an ameliorative measure right, in, in, in your local environment or, or in your local community, right? And I think those two, things, those two things can work together. But I don't think gradualism and revolution can work together at the national level. I feel like I've also felt that despair, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have, but I also feel like I'd like to know your reflections on what we've been seeing these last two summers, um, both in uprisings and the sort of potential that they've, um, or the way that they've rejuvenated a lot of movements. I think about the fact that like last summer, a lot of us were thinking like within our lifetime to break Palestine is possible, like the discourse changed so rapidly. Um, we have Mohammed Amun al Kurd just, you know, going on CNN and shutting them down. Yeah. People are chanting from the river to the sea. People have lost their jobs for doing less. And so I'm thinking both if you think there's a connection between the two movements, both in 2020 and 2021, but also how these mass uprisings, bigger than I think I've ever experienced, are um, shaping the way you think of possibility in the future. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the kind words and um, for the. The, the the terrific reflections and, and the question. Um, sorry, like there's a little voice in the back of my head saying you don't have to say everything you've been thinking for the past two years. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it it's like boom because I've been thinking a lot about it, and and there really hasn't been a play. You know, I, I'm, I'm you know my my website. I, I, I try to think through those things. Um, again, I don't, don't don't use social media much. Every now and again, I will, but. You know, I'm, I'm really like not emotionally prepared anymore to, to get screamed at online, if that makes any sense. See, there was a time where I didn't give a shit, now I care, so you know, you have to sort of adjust accordingly. But I've been thinking so much about that, that it, you know, it, go, it goes back to, to Fanon for me, you know, the idea of, of, of what, what he calls violent resistance or violence in resistance, which you know, you always have to qualify that when, when speaking to audiences in the United States. But uh, I'll just say, you know, read the Wretched of the Earth, the chapter on violence, and and, and, and uh, figure it out for yourself. Um, and I'm not say, trying to be snarky to you. I'm trying to the people, you know, who are who are typing up their little uh, their little Canary Mission blog saying <laughs> he supports violence. You know, uh, you know. Anyway, um, so the. And the way that, that it creates a sense of, of dignity. In other words, Fanon put it in terms of, of it creates the new man. Yeah, this is a gendered language, but uh, you know, we could update it and say he's talking about the new human, right? Uh, it, it, it recreates our, our sense of, of life and purpose anew after having been beaten down and humiliated and, and dispossessed, that, uh, that it, it gives us something to. To hang on to a sense of meaning, and I found that again, I'm not, you know, my my, my conditions aren't like, um, you know, an Algerian's under French rule, but it's it's rings really true for me when the the uprisings were happening, and then I, I try to be careful not to 
invest, not to, to add on to the burdens of, of, of black people in this country. Like, you know, you all gonna have to lead the revolution for everybody else, right? Because I know it's their bodies on the line, right? It's, it's their, um, you know, it's, 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 it's their, it's their uh, economic livelihood on the line, right? They're the ones who are, who are, who are getting dragged off the street and, and put into prison, in some cases assassinated. So I, I like to be mindful of not saying, you know, uh, you know, when black people do this, it makes me feel great. So what I, I, the way I would put it is that, that to see people reacting to continual state violence by eschewing all of the formal rules of liberal protest right, and just go do something was exhilarating and inspiring and you know there were the the you know it, it got uh you know it, it got pretty intense in 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 dc you know uh I'm not as active in the world as I'd like to be, but um, you know, I I tried to lend my a hand and tried to to lend a, a voice in support. But you know, the, when that police station went down, I'm telling you, that was a real moment of hope. I I, I just I was like, God damn, you know, they're serious, you know, and that got resolved. You know, none of this voting go uh you know go write a letter to your council person you know like okay fine fine okay. do that stuff if you want but it, it's not going to get the same kind of results and we know it ain't going to get the same kind of results because power needs to feel threatened right? the other thing that again going back to my talk that it's really hard to talk about because people aren't in a position to talk about it. well i don't have a job so i can talk about it okay they are i can't get fired right now okay so that in a sense, that's a blessing, right? You know, when I was a, a professor, when I was tenured, you know, it's like, oh God, you know, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna tag my uh, employer on Twitter. They're gonna create a profile on me. They're gonna do this. They're gonna, okay, tag my employer, motherfucker. Do you know what I mean? Uh, go, you know, go. You know, so, so, it, it, so I can say that. It, you know, you can think it if you're if you can't say it, but there's no denying. Though the, there was a moment. Right? And everybody who was paying attention felt it. A lot of people felt uh, exhilarated, and a lot of people felt really, really scared. Right? Same thing in a different way. Last summer, in, uh, was it last summer? I, I'm sorry, I don't, don't even remember the dates, but there, there was, you know, um, uh, Israel was, was pulling its usual bullshit in, 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 in Gaza. Uh, and this after it had been. Um, displacing people in Sheikh Jarrah in, um, in East Jerusalem. And, you know, there was, you know, they call it a conflict or a war, a conflagration, but Israel began bombing the Gaza Strip, all right? And, and as per usual, um, it was bombing civilian areas. Um, it's pretty much impossible to bomb any place in the Gaza Strip that doesn't have uh, uh, civilian areas. It's, it's, it's crowded in that way. And the resistance, and when I say the resistance, I'm not, I'm going to be forthright. I'm not just using code for Hamas, right? Hamas is a major element of, of that resistance, but it was, it was a cross party kind of reaction. It involved the, you know, the Marxist Leninist uh, PFLP, for example. Um, it involved Islamic Jihad, really all of the, the you know, Fatah, all of the political groups in Gaza, right? You can say led by Hamas, which is the, the biggest of them, started firing back, right? And they really backed Israel off in a way that hadn't been done since Hezbollah had done the same thing right, on its northern border some years before. And again, in the environs that, that I hang around in, you know, uh, on social media and otherwise, people felt exhilarated. You know, they 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 were cheering Palestinian armed resistance and that's something that doesn't happen in this country for many many reasons right primary among them the fact that you might get a knock on your door in the middle of the night if you do that kind of thing but people were doing it and it felt amazing to see it happen and so it, all of this you know i guess to, to tie it all together i'm sorry i'm sorry I, I was rambling but i just i get really frustrated sometimes at, at what I, I see to be a glacial pace 
of things, of, of pragmatism, of, okay, do A, B, C, D, E, and F. It's like, okay, you know, or you can punch them right back in the fucking mouth, right? And, you know, and then you can go straight to X, Y, and Z. It might, might not, you know, might not get you the outcome that you want, but you're going to get their attention. Right? And so I'm not in any position now. I'm, I'm sitting in, in Philadelphia in, in a beautiful bookstore, um, you know, talking about things that, that I'm not doing with my own hands. I'm not in Gaza firing rockets. I'm, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm setting, uh, you know, sparks to um, government buildings, etc. But what we can do as political consumers, right, as participants in, in different types of public politics, is to quit disciplining people who speak in favor of things that have been shown over and over and over again throughout history to work, right? You don't have to agree with them, but stop forcing everything back into the same liberal exceptionalist paradigm. It's tiresome, right? It's insulting, it's often hurtful. Let people celebrate. You know, I, I, I've seen so many Palestinians online get reamed or lectured you know for for you know their lack of civility or or their um you know their uh, uh their their lack of um uh what, what's even the right word uh, you know not humoring things that they shouldn't you know, it's like when i said earlier that I, I i don't do zionism don't care don't do it you know what i mean for that right oh you you're so unreasonable, you're so irrational, you know, uh, you gotta have dialogue, you gotta, why you gotta be that way? Just mind your own business. Let them be that way, right? Because the, the fact of the matter is, you can look at the history of Palestine since 1948 and take a measure of what kind of resistance, I'm not even talking in the binary of violent or nonviolent, just what kind of resistance, right, has tended to produce the kind of results that people we're out for and what kind of resistance has ended up enriching a neo-colonial class of traders living large in in ramallah while everybody else is still living in in, in some sort of misery right so we have to let we have to let people think about politics and possibility right, beyond your liberal notion of, of common sense, I guess. And, and there's, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people get mad at me. I hope my parents aren't watching, right? But uh, they're, 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 there's just no denying the feeling of exhilaration, right, uh, in certain moments. And if, if you felt the same kind of exhilaration, saying happiness, I'm saying exhilaration, right? Uh, uh, since that wow, something meaningful just happened, right? Then um, you know there are plenty of avenues right, to explore why that feeling might have come into existence and and what it means in 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 terms of your political prerogatives and priorities. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, just thanks for that that talk and everything you said. This is great. Um, my question is just, you know, you pointed out the like overwhelming uh, chauvinism and settler like ideology that's present in even the left. And like there's that that's obvious with the trend toward the left and reformism and stuff, but even on the so-called radical left, it seems that any amount of like internationalism just amounts to like having twenty people downtown with some signs talking and going home. Yeah. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on like some Real, real ways that we can practice internationalism in, you know, in the imperial court. Yeah. Um, I personally think that we need to be more anti-military. Mm -hmm. People are not, don't see it as like the police of the world, even though we're so anti-police here, we're not anti-police anywhere else. Yeah. But I'm curious if you have like some concrete yeah. things that we can do. I'll, I'll try. Thanks for the the, the kind of rest of your legal ability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, I, this one stumps me. Um, you know, I, I, somebody were to, you know, to, to walk in and ask, well, you know, what the hell is this gathering, you know, doing for the good of the world? 
I, I don't know that I'd be able to provide an answer, but um, I, but I guess sometimes you do it because you need to do it. You need to do something. You need to talk to somebody. Sometimes you need to be downtown with 20 people that you trust carrying signs. Um, is, is that gonna, um, you know, all of a sudden defund the military? No. <laughs> is, is it gonna change anybody's mind? Maybe a passerby or two, right? If you're lucky, right? Maybe somebody will stop to talk, you know, bum a cigarette and, uh, and, and you know, in that, that five to seven minutes, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get that person on your side. I understand that we want, we want to feel like we're doing something useful and, and productive and shit. I struggle with that all the time. You know, so I, I, I'm more, I know empathizing with, with your position than I am, um, you know, uh, providing any, any sort of useful answer, but I guess, um, I, I, I've gotten to the point in, in life where I'm, I'm, I'm starting to to enter into the, you know crotchety old man mode every time I cut my hair. You know that's the you know the, the pieces that fly the corner of my eyes are whiter and whiter and whiter than they used to be. You know, and so I got to the point where I just I'm just want to find a way to keep the idea alive. And, and that's, I guess, I've, I've written a lot about it. And, and, I, and, and I know that's not good enough for, for a lot of people, nor should it be. But at this point in my life, you know, I've, I've, I've been in some situations, I've done some things, you know, I've gone through some things. I'm not, not trying to rest on any laurels or, or, or ask for, for instant credibility. I'm not, but I guess, I'm, I'm most interested in, in keeping the idea of freedom alive. And that's the, the, what we bestow onto the next generation or the generation actually that, that, um, you know, the, you know, for, for Zionism, the, the primary errand besides the land was, um, was for Palestinians to forget, you know, and then it was supposed to happen after, you know, a generation or two that, you know, life goes on. You know they're they're living in Jordan or they're in Kuwait or Canada or wherever and they're fine. But we remembered, and by remembering, we we we've, we've done something really really dangerous to to the colonial entity, right? And not only we remembered, but I think our, that our the intensity of our feelings for for that homeland are, are have gone have grown even stronger over the years. And so that that's what I mean by keeping the idea alive. That uh, if if you don't feel like what you're doing is enough, that the protests you're going to are doing enough, that the gatherings that you're going to are doing enough, that the readings you're doing, uh, you know, are, are, are not accomplishing what you want them to accomplish. Think about the importance at the very least of, of keeping the idea alive, right? And um, it, it, it might not fulfill all of your aspirations, but it's at least a good baseline and you can sort of work from there. I have to say that Part of the reason for my recalcitrance is that I'm pretty pessimistic about the possibility of, of real revolutionary action happening from within the, the, the US polity that, you know, there's, there's a lot of factionalism, there's a lot of opportunism, there's a lot of infiltration, right? All of these things, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges. I just, it's, and the people who've gotten anywhere close you know, to, to, to creating uh, real change have been, have been, God forbid, snuffed out. You know, Fred Hampton, they shot him in his bed. You know, uh, some of the people, uh, you know, God rest their souls from Ferguson have died in mysterious circumstances. That, that, that the state has really literally endless resources to, to keep us in line or, or, to, or to stop things before they really get started. So for, but then that's not even to say, you know, not even getting to the, the ideologies that people hold. I, I'm just, so I think that the one thing we can do besides keeping the idea alive is uh, seeing what's happening in, in other parts of the world, right? Um, I think that there's revolutionary energy in, in indigenous communities in, in North America. There's revolutionary energy in, in, in black communities. Uh, 
there's revolutionary energy in some working class uh, communities, but there's a lot of revolutionary energy also around the world. Right? And you know, we we could, we could sort of uh, you know, I think if anything is going to happen serious inside the United States, my guess is it's going to start from somewhere outside the United States. And, and I just want to say because I just remember, you know, I was like nodding on the inside when you said it about uh, the military. And I, 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 this is just a complaint. I'm just. I'm just bitching now. Sorry, but uh, I, I, it, I, it, it does bother me that, that there is an ironclad, no cops rule in the left. That the world doesn't bother me. Sorry, but but there's a but. But that we're willing to you know to accept you know uh, ex-military. I, I don't. I, I'm not ipso facto opposed to ex-military. Don't get me wrong, but I do think people especially from the places that the, where the U.S. military has been present, at least have a right to know what you did. You know, you need to be open, you need to be honest. You need to quit banging the fuck on about how you're a veteran. That's what bothers me, right? The veteran this, veteran that, veteran this, veteran that. You know, it's like, okay, you might not be in the middle, you still got that attitude. Do you want everybody to keep this in your ass and to treat you as your special? So you're in the military, you're a veteran. Do you know what I mean? And, and that shit runs deep. But... It's that if if we're gonna have an injunction against uh, the participation of cops, right? The same ex injunction I think needs to exist against military unless the military have accounted for what it was they have done and have sought, right? Uh, um, you know, some some sort of absolution from people who come from the countries where they serve. That that seems um, fair to me, but what, I could be wrong. You, you, you could argue against me, I don't know. I, I don't ever, you know, whatever. But the point is, instead of thinking about, well, should we deal with uh, ex-military or not? Maybe think about the question of why are, are, are we willing to perceive cops in one way and, and military in the other? And is there an element of, of exceptionalism that, that is coloring? Are thinking, right? I mean, maybe the, on some level, we still attach to the idea of, of the USA as, as a force of good or, or civility in the world. And, I, and that's the, 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 the biggest problem to me that, uh, you know, so the, the military is not only a, 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 a huge purveyor of, of physical violence, but it's the world's worst purveyor of ecological violence on the world, too. So, anyway. <laughs> I just want to ask, I'm not disagreeing with you because I understand what you're it's saying. It's okay. Uh, but because I, I understand, you know, you're saying violence can't be considered off the table because that is uh, sort of the balance of the liberal uh, uh, conception of how everything works and that it can't be effective factors. I think clearly in Brother Ba in, uh, in the South Chiapas, you know, there was a clearly effective methodology to use the violence means. But then I also wonder, um, and I'm sorry if I confused my history sometimes, but prior to the uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, they were begging for Lebanon to attack them. You know, they wanted a a reason to be able to justify their incursion, right? Yeah. And similarly, um, you know, the attack on the capital is all white people, right? If it was a bunch of people of color, you you would think the politicians or the the state would be overjoyed. There was an open season, you know, like we got attacked by some black people. Wonderful, right? Because they they're not. Of, they have greater military power and all of this. Sure. So I just wonder how you um, conceive of what the balance should be between, um, you know, like what is uh, valuable violence and what is counter counterproductive violence. Sure, sure. No, no. That's that's a, that's a great point. It it it. And it sounds like a cop out, but um, it, it depends on the situation, depends on the the, the, the conditions. That's not hard, yeah. <laughs> no, no. So, like, okay, these these are things that that happen at, at the local level, right? The 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 activists who are who are hitting the street, whether it's in Atlanta or or St. Louis or or Detroit or or Philadelphia or wherever, Baltimore, you know, that that that's something for them to manage. Depending on their their needs, depending on the situation, depending on what um, the core organizers or or what the the the, the people gripped by spontaneity, right? The, you know, decide is viable for them. So, in the case of of 
of Palestine, right? Uh, let's say no, sorry. Let's say Lebanon and 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 Israel. You know, that's that is something that uh, the the various resistance groups weigh. So what you're saying is always uh, or always should be an important consideration. That um, you know, I, I think um, Fadan more than anybody would would have uh, would would have uh, spoken against. Uh, Sort of gratuitous or, or pointless violence, right? Um, that he, he would have seen a, a, a need for a, a, a violence that is specifically in the service of liberation, something that's going to harm what needs to be harmed and, and minimize or, or hopefully avoid altogether, right? Harm to uh, to anybody not implicated in, in the machinery of, of colonization or, or imperialism. So it depends, but yes. There are certainly times that that uh, any kind of, of violence is is a no go or a bad idea, and in fact, I think we're constantly making that decision too, if only unconsciously, right? That that um, you know we we choose all the time to to participate in society or to participate in activist groups without even thinking about the possibility of, of you know do, doing something so. Um, Something so forceful or, or 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 serious, and so yeah, I think for for any group, you always have to measure the tactical prospect up against a set of ethical considerations, right? And also uh, up against a, a, a set of of geopolitical circumstances. Is this even going to work? Right? Uh, what what do we want it to do? But I don't think that that. Violence, insofar as it becomes somebody's tactic, should ever be um, uh, should ever be gratuitous, right? Um, it, it, it needs to have a very specific and, and well thought out and well considered purpose. Okay. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a comment. Sure. Um, in, in lieu of kind of like the hopelessness, or if there's going to be like change the houses very impactful, exactly. I do like the idea to be positive about keeping the idea alive because that's how movements end is when ideas yeah. die. Yeah. Um, but also every storm begins with one raindrop. I love that. That's how things start. I love that. Thank you yeah. so much. That's it. Um, thanks again for the talk. Uh, your candor is very uh, refreshing. Um, yeah, well, you said a lot of things that really uh, stood out to me. One's like this feeling of depression and this lack of like uh, possibility of the future. Two, building solidarity. Um, and three, like no Zionist. Um, and I'm interested in like where that ties in with like people in your inner circle that are family or like close family friends you've had for a while. Um, you found that in the past couple years they show their ass and they're just like. <laughs> Yeah, how do you like balance that level of interpersonal trust in this community that you have, knowing that they might have like some shitty or outdated thoughts, with like building solidarity and meeting new people? Um, you know, like I'm here with some friends and not others, right? And how do you feel that? Uh, that's a, a that's a great question. Uh, it maybe goes back to uh, what we were just discussing about the tactical use of violence. Uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to decide if, if the, you know, if the, the proverbial Thanksgiving tables have become a war zone or, or, or a site of peace, right? Um, and I don't, you know, that's, I, I hope it doesn't sound uh, too dismissive when I say that's, that's, that's personal because, um, you know, I, 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 I probably all, I certainly all of us uh, navigate what, what you're saying to some degree. So I, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer. Um, it's, it's a matter of, of choosing your battles, but, but again, we have to keep in mind that, you know, we say that all oh, politics shouldn't, uh, you know, shouldn't uh, interrupt friendship. The hell it shouldn't, you know, uh, you know, and even if it shouldn't, it does, <laughs> it, it does. A lot of, you know, I know a bunch of friendships that, that have ended just over the issue of masking and vaccine, right? So don't tell me that the, the politics are so neutral that they're just these things that we do. No, politics represent values, right? They re represent aspirations. And, and sometimes if you feel like you're in conflicting values with somebody else to the point where, where there's, there, there's just no sense in even trying to be friends with that person. With family, we don't have the, the same, maybe the same kind of, of choice, but I... 
I'm I'm an outlier, I think, largely in in my family. I'm lucky in that uh, you know my the nuclear family I grew up with doesn't really have any any problem with with my politics. There's you know there's some tension, there's some disagreement. You know, I, I think that uh, you know, I think that my old man still isn't isn't happy that I got fired, right? You know what I mean? You know, he's 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 thinking like an immigrant. You know, and uh, but but you know, for the most part, you know. We can yammer, but in the you know the broader family and in the social sense of the family, let's say you know the the Palestinian American community or the Palestinian diaspora community, there are deep disagreements, you know, both strategy and 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 uh, ideology. And I I don't think that this is necessarily good advice for any of you. <laughs> Right? Uh, but I tend to avoid that kind of confrontation. Um, pr probably that's a, a defense mechanism. It's it's probably some to some degree an emotional response to uh, you know a set of of uh, political traumas. But um, I, I I just just as soon um, keep those subjects out of my mouth um, when it comes to people that I'm obliged you know, to share some kind of familiar or, or intimate space with. But when it comes, let's say, to the broader notion of, of family, let's say my uh, diasporic Palestinian family, then I'm, I'm usually more willing to, uh, you know, to, to say something, even knowing that it, it might generate a conflict. Uh, because in, in that case, I understand that there might be like a legitimate political utility to a conflict. Right to an airing out of, of differences that that doesn't necessarily exist around the dinner table with your brother-in-law. Like, do, do you know what I'm saying? That so I could think as if there's any sort of uh, is there any sort of utility to um, you know to 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 getting into this argument with this person? And that depends on whether it's public or private. And if it's public, what the purpose is? Is it just because I want to smack this person down and 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 humiliate them online? Okay, maybe that's worthy. Maybe that's not. Right, depends on the person. Uh, but if 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 I'm arguing in in service of a point that I refuse to compromise on or let go of, that I see that this person is constantly compromising on, then yeah, I think an intervention might be absolutely worthwhile, even if that person and that person's friends end up sort of piling on you. Right, so you. You have to decide uh, what the purpose of the argument is, and then what kind of, of response you're willing or to or capable of accepting. Uh, you know, sometimes you're not in the mood to get screamed at, right? You know what I mean? Sometimes, like you feel like you could do it. Yeah, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm taking off my mask because it's like a really soft voice. Um, I wanted to ask if you speak more about kind of the place where you ended your talk. You said you cannot have solidarity without recognition. This giving over of yourself, this learning, this process of changing, and outfitting yourself with the skill of outfitting the universal with the specific. Uh -huh. And that deeply resonates with me. I'm also a historian, so I can't resist asking you a historical question, even if it's a, a history of the present. But what are those moments that you would look to? Where to give us that sense of possibility of solidarity? Okay, thanks. Um, I, it's really um, thoughtful and and um, but but challenging and and made all the more so that, that you're you're drawing from, from the from the words that I used. Um, and and I'm 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 honored. I'm flattered that that you have. I I guess. Um, I guess when I was writing up the comments, I was thinking about you know what 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 solidarity might mean in 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 this current moment. Uh, I've written about it before. A lot of people have it. It's it's the subject of of, of debate and and some ridicule in you know in, in online spaces now that you know it's just an empty word and empty meaning. But uh, solidarity like decolonization. It's just not a word that that I'm, I'm quite willing to give up, 
And so I, 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 I like it too much. I think it has too much potential. I don't care how watered down other people make it, that, that, that it has an inherent value to it. Um, and so I, I was thinking about what, what solidarity might mean, not just to me, but to, to other people, you know, beyond just, um, beyond just, just uh, you know, chit-chatting or dialoguing with somebody. Does, does it have a more permanent definition or the possibility of a more permanent definition? What, what can we do to make solidarity meaningful and and long lasting and then and, and it was in that sense that that i landed on the word recognition the word you know recognition because it connotes in so many different ways that that i as somebody interested in palestine i'm going to recognize your claims as as uh, as a, a native person right in north or south america wherever you happen to be uh, your claims to liberation, not just to sovereignty, right, uh, but to liberation, and to become stewards of of your own ancestral land. Um, I'm I'm going to recognize the struggle and desire of Black people to be liberated, right, of of continual state violence, whatever that ends up looking like. I don't have to have a say in that. I can support it and then and, and, and support what the outcomes are. So the, it's in that sense of recognition. I, I do, and I expect other people to to recognize the necessity of Palestine's liberation. So that was one sense of, of recognition that that I was thinking about. The other sense of, of recognition is that uh, that we're not just political animals, that it might be the political that sparks our interest in solidarity, but that the, there's a human um, component to what solidarity can do, that, uh, that, that solidarity can, can exist as, as a kind of education. Uh, I, I, I suddenly um, am obliged, happily, but obliged to hear what you're trying to tell me about yourself about your family, about your relations, about your history, about what you imagine to be your future. Right? I'm obliged to listen. I'm obliged to learn. Right? I'm going to start reading you things because of this relationship. Right? I'm obliged to teach insofar as you're willing to learn, right? Uh, or as long as you desire to learn, to tell you where I'm coming from, to tell you what, what my family's history looks like, to tell you what... Uh, you know what what interests me about um, a Palestinian future, etc. And, and, and it, it's that I guess that that double sense of of, of recognition of, of of I guess uh, historical recognition and then um, uh, an interpersonal recognition. Right? And so I when I get to the point, I, I guess. Uh, where we're not just talking, but we we feel invested in a positive outcome for, for both parties. And we, we can't imagine one without the other. And it really, I mean, it, I've been thinking about this thing for a long time, but I mean, it really hit home for me um, when, when, um, when I visited um, Hawaii, I think it was in 2017, maybe it was in 2016. Um, you know, it was about four or five years ago. And, um, you know, I, I really got, uh, it wasn't for some tourist thing. Uh, you know, I'd been um, in, invited, uh, you know, to give some talks and then to, to meet some people. And just the, um, the sense of intimacy and familiarity that uh, I got to experience in the presence of, of my Kanaka Maoli hosts was, was something that, that stayed with me deeply. And I, I remember leaving um, after so many powerful conversations after so many powerful uh tricks around the island unfortunately i never made it off of oahu i wasn't there long enough but i got to see i got to see enough right not nearly you know you know what i mean i got to see enough to get the point across and just the whole way home the whole flight home it was just you know my head was spinning i was like this this is you know I'm probably, you know, going to insult two different national communities here, but this this is Palestine. You know, this is to me this is Palestine. You know, 
right? And I, and I know indigenous peoples from, you know, from uh, the, the so-called Western Hemisphere who've gone to Palestine and, and felt it in the same way, right? That once you go and you see it and you meet the people, you eat the food, you know, you hear the sounds, the, it gets in your bloodstream. And I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really that experience of, of Hawaii that I had that, that really got into my bloodstream in a way that made me want to keep thinking of, of, of solidarity as, as more than just, uh, you know, a convenient exchange, but as, as something that becomes meaningful to both parties that, that, that you know, if, if, you know, Zionism went away tomorrow, right? Um, I, I, I still wouldn't feel the same kind of happiness. I would, right? If, if Zionism and, and settler colonization in the Pacific went away simultaneously, right? That, that we're, we're invested in each other in, in that way. And, um, you know, that, that, I think that happens to a lot of us when, when we get the opportunity to, to travel and to meet new people. So in some sense, maybe in its most basic sense, um, you know, solidarity is a form of communication. Close to running out of time. We have one for her one more question. Would it work to take two at the same time? Yeah, I'll I'll try not to talk too much because I want to get you to, to to say or ask whatever it is you want to. Um, as a response to the first question about you know parents who were very quickly about your child, um, right, and like wanting to have a future for the children. So I guess my, my question is like very simply, what what's our responsibility to you? So like when I think about that, I think about my younger siblings, I think about the children when I grew up in public libraries and they also feel that hopelessness uh -huh. and I don't want them to hold that. And in some way, we do for them what we do for each other, yeah. but they're also growing, and so it's more than that, right? So like, what do you do for them? Yeah. That's, that's such a beautiful question. I'm going to answer it quickly because I, 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 I want to, to get to the other one also. Um, honestly, it's the kind of question that I'm going to think about <laughs> probably the entire way home. and. And then I'm going to come up with a decent answer, right? I'm going to go, oh, shit, that's what I should have said. But um, I, off the cuff, I would say that, that our first responsibility to them is, is, is safety and love. You know, when we're talking children, that, that's what I always come back to because um, – you know their, their brains are, are are developing and and you know you, you you they're not gonna function optimally as as adults you know if if their synapses weren't uh, developed correct i know i sound like i'm talking junk science but i it's not, <laughs> i just don't know the right terminology all right but, but i you know a, a, a dear friend of mine that her her, her her sister just had a baby and she told me i, I keep you know, I keep hugging this baby and everybody tells me that, you know, that, you know, he, he's not, you know, it, it doesn't matter. He, I was like, no, trust me, he gets it. He has a memory already. He's a week old. I'm telling you, he could suffer trauma already. And so that's, that's, I guess, I, you, there are a lot of ways to connect that to a revolutionary politics. But I think first and foremost, we, we need to create, um, you know, healthy human beings, right? And, and I think with, with, with children, that, that's especially Im, important because um, that's what we, we, we need to provide safety and security and, and above all, love and, and physical comfort. And if we want them you know, to, to, to flourish, in any way as, as, as they move through life, we cannot be the kind of greedy capitalist that puts our own immediate monetary gratification right, uh, ahead of, of, of allowing a world to exist for them to even enjoy in the first place. So it's it's a mixture, I guess, of, of love and sacrifice. I know that's not a great answer. I, I'm going to keep 
keep thinking about it, but uh, but you know sometimes the the the, the basic stuff is um, you know is, is really all we need. Please. Uh, peace and blessings to everybody in the room. My name is Kim Roll with the Philly Muslim Freedom Fund. We're a decent bail fund that we collaborated uh, with making World Clothes Store. Um, I first want to thank you all just for hosting this event here today. Uh, Professor Dillon as well. Shout out to the Canadian Prairies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is where I really initially developed some of my indigenous politics as a child. Um, my question for you is, is around solidarity, especially for those of us that navigate multiple spheres, multiple terrains, um, you know, immigrant communities, our yeah. parents' generation, yeah. uh, I'm South Asian, so you know, I'm Muslim. Uh -huh. um, I don't mean it so much in an identity yeah. sense, but even in a metaphysical sense where there's contradictions that I feel deep in the recesses of my soul, like there's a revolution yeah. brewing inside of me, right? But I can also navigate that. Please offer some advice. <laughs> oh man! Oh, oh my goodness! Okay. Oh. It is. It, it is. It is. So thank you. Um, I am. I'm gonna have to come back. Just those last two questions already have obliged me to come back and be like, I swear. Like I thought about it. Uh, but you're not gonna get such a clunky answer next time. I, wow. Here's another way of reframing it. Yeah. How do you stay true and authentic to yourself and your politics while moving in many spaces? I, I don't often, or I don't always, anyway, feel like I do. Um, that's a, a constant struggle, and and maybe even having that as a struggle is 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 a way of of keeping us uh, grounded, maybe even honest. I think about it a lot. Um, I've kind of gone, um, you know, uh, in recent times, sort of uh, reclusive. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, really do uh, media and 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 do many events anymore. And in a sense, that has allowed me to, to 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 feel like I'm still true to myself. Not 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 because I want to uh, avoid people, but because sometimes you don't feel like. Your voice is 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 especially needed or or helpful in that moment, right? So I try to gravitate towards places where I I feel that you know I can be of of use to whoever is is summoning me, right? Um, I try I try to go to to spaces in, in in the media or otherwise where there's going to be an, an emphasis on 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 Palestine or, or an, another group of the downtrodden I, I, I don't want to um, I, I don't want to go on you know I don't want to go on 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 Bill Maher and and, and argue with somebody for example um, so I, I guess I try to create state true to myself by having a set of maybe what you could call conditions in my mind that I'm determined not to compromise on no matter what happens. And I try to avoid putting myself in a position where those boundaries or those conditions might be uh, transgressed that um, I, I, you know, I've been asked to, you know, give talks in the past with, with, uh, uh, you know, liberal Zionist co-panelists and I, I always have said no for different reasons but one of the reasons that i say no to that kind of thing is to ask myself being on a stage with this person you know or these people am i going to feel the need to self-censor and if the answer is yes then i'm done i'm not going right uh, am i going to feel the need to appease an, an audience by somehow um, watering down 
a set of politics to which I'm absolutely devoted. And the answer is, is, is yes, I keep away from that also. And I'm also conversely ready to throw down right? if, if, if somebody is, is asking or demanding that, that uh, I transgress that, that you know, those, those conditions or those politics to which I'm, I'm devoted. So just, you have to, we each have to figure out what are the set, what is the set of things that you're not going to mess around with, that, that you're going to be absolutely firm on, no matter what an antagonist or enemy tries to, to do to you. And, you know, there, I think we all function in that way. And it's always a matter as well of, of not wanting to contribute to phenomena in the world that, that I see as, as problematic. You know, I'll watch something on TV or see something online and it annoys me. And it's just like, well, why does this happen? You know, then when I get the chance to do that sort of thing, it's like, no, 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 I'm not, not going to reproduce this. So it's it's constantly a struggle. But I I, I wish I could be truer to myself. Um, I, I you know I, I I don't know where ultimately the 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 balance is right, between being reasonably recalcitrant and being stupidly irrationally stubborn i just don't know but um i you've got me thinking so many things I, you know my mouth is not keeping up with with my brain let me just say that let me just say that you know what in the end you're gonna lay down wherever the hell it is you sleep even if somebody's next to you, even if, if 10 people are next to you, you're going to shut your eyes and you're going to be alone. All right? Or are you going to be able to sleep? Are you going to be able to live with yourself in that moment enough at least to carry you through to the next day where you're going to try it all again? And that's my main criterion. Yeah, when, when I got shit canned from, from my academic job, damn, they gave me so many opportunities to apologize. You know, I die before I apologize. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I gotta shut my eyes. I gotta be alone with myself. In the end, I gotta be accountable to me. And there are just certain lines I won't cross. And and that to me, you know, it doesn't put food on the table per se, but it is uh, you know uh, the ability to 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 not live with that kind of regret. It's is 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 something that can't necessarily be quantified by uh, by money or, or or professional success or whatever that you know there's there's something immeasurably valuable about um, ab about about feeling like you did the right thing that you know as tacky as that sounds and that probably doesn't you know that anyway, anyway yeah well I think you know? that is an excellent way to end the conversation today I want to thank you on um, behalf of the Making Worlds Worker Cooperative um, for being you know, so open and generous and thoughtful and caring and self-reflective um, and inspiring despite the um, declaration of pessimism <laughs> earlier <laughs> on in the conversation. And I'm, I know it sounds like from the questions that we've heard that what you've offered has resonated so much, means so much to people, and we're super excited you know, just honored to have you in our company. And thank you for making the time to drive here and take time away from your family to join us. And so please join me in welcoming, or in <laughs> thanking Stephen for thank such you. a beautiful thank you. Thank, you. thank you all so much.